Uh, so we're, we're in a series uh, that we've been calling Embrace the Breaking. Uh, and as, as you read scripture um, in general and as you read the gospels in particular, um, you see this consistent theme of God breaking in and powerfully showing up in the lives of broken people. Amen? Now, that should be an encouragement to all of us, because if you name the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and if you uh, call yourself a child of God, then you know this is your testimony as well, yeah? And so we're going to uh, look at this short passage today, uh, and and really it's a a head-scratching experience of Jesus as he heads back Uh, to his hometown in the early part of his ministry, he goes back to his hometown. He attempts to minister to his home. Now, if you're a believer uh, and and you know this, that the hardest place to minister is our homes. Amen. The hardest place for us to minister in our homes, but nothing yields greater returns in the kingdom. Nothing yields greater returns. It's the best soil you've gotten if you sow well. If you sow well, you will eat from the fruit of your labor all the days of your life. Amen? Amen. As you study church history, um, and as you look at the the reformers, uh, the the John Calvins, the Martin Luthers, and those boys, uh, they looked at the scriptures, and they insisted that uh, marriage is ordained by God, and they saw the family as the arena of some of the most important spiritual work. Uh, Martin Luther actually went so far as to say, that marriage is a greater school of character than any monastery because it is there that your corners are rubbed off. Amen. That's what he said. And so your home is the most challenging place to live out the gospel implications. No one is more impacted by your sins and flaws than your family. Now, there's a relief to this. The relief is no one is... Uh, more impacted by your family's sins and flaws than you are. And so God uh, is using your daily grind and your micro choices to train your heart. Um, I've heard it uh, said this way about the ministry of the home. It's been referred to as the mask of God, uh, which is to say that God hides himself in the ordinary and dull and mundane activities that make up most of our lives. Can I, can I say it how I feel it? Yeah. When you are loving your spouse, even when you're not getting anything back in return, when you are striving with an overly dependent, self-absorbed child that is sucking the life out of you, and if you're a breastfeeding mother, I'm talking literally for you. <laughs> right? When you are engaged in the daily, thankless, endless cycle of cooking, cleaning, laundry, drop off, pickup, et cetera, et cetera, God is doing something in you by his spirit that has eternal value, has eternal value. And so I believe it was, it was Peter, uh, Peter in his uh, epistle Uh, He says this, he says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence, right? Which means that everything you and I need for life and godliness can be cultivated in our homes. And let me tell you why. The reason why is because godliness and holiness happens where in broken places we do the ordinary extraordinarily well. That's how this works. How do we do this? I think Jesus shows us in this passage today. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 6. Now, if you follow the itinerary of Jesus in the book of Mark, uh, you will see that he began his public ministry in Capernaum. Uh, There he uh, recruited his disciples. He did miracles. He healed people. Uh, Then he went uh, to a uh, nearby town called Gennesaret, Uh, He healed someone there. He was asked to leave. Then he traveled across the Sea of Galilee, and he went to Decapolis. There, uh, he ministered as well. He taught. He did miracles. But by Mark chapter 6, Jesus is headed to his hometown of Nazareth. Now, surely by this point, the people heard the news of his miracles and his healing, right? But, But I want you guys to see 
how these people treat this hometown kid. Okay, I want you guys to see this. So Mark chapter six, starting in verse one, it says this. It says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What, what are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. And so I believe that Jesus' homecoming shows us three things. I just want to go over this with you guys in our time together. Jesus' homecoming shows us, number one, the hiddenness of God's kingdom. Number two, the ordinariness and the brokenness of God's people. And thirdly, the amplification of God's message. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this time. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We welcome you here today, God. We thank you for your presence. Lord, there are those who came here today and without even knowing, they've been prayed for. We've prayed them into this room today. And so we ask God that you would give them what they came for. God, I cannot knock upon the outside of hearts and be let in. Only you can do it from the inside. And so God, do what you will in this time together. We just thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 All right, so the hiddenness of God's kingdom, the ordinariness and brokenness of God's people, and the, the amplification of God's message. So first, the hiddenness of God's kingdom. So Jesus arrives in his hometown of Nazareth, and one of the first things he does is he walks into the synagogue and he teaches from Scripture. Now think about this. One of the first things Jesus does when he comes home is an act of love and service. What do you do when you first come home? Are you looking to be served? Looking for dinner? Looking for everyone to run to you to say hi? I'm preaching to myself. His first act was an act of love and service. He goes right into the synagogue and he teaches. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to think about the demands that are, that are on us in family life. Um, when I was a 20-year-old youth pastor, I was being mentored by a, a guy who came to me one day and he said, Hey, Sean, are you called to the ministry? To which I quickly responded, yes. To which he quickly responded, No. He said, go home, get married, start a family, and come and see me in a couple years, and I'll tell you if you're qualified for ministry. I was so mad. I was so mad. Like, I was fired up, upset. But now, I know something now that I did not know then, which is that marriage and family are a, a sort of a greenhouse for spiritual formation. They are a greenhouse for spiritual formation. To thrive in family life, you need to discipline your heart to always have an attitude that says, forget about me, I love you. Say that with me. Forget about me, I love you. And as you do that over and over again, you begin to embody some of the major principles in the kingdom of God. It was sort of like uh, the movie Karate Kid. All right, and I've used this before, but this, man, this, this example slaps, so I'm just going to use it again. <laughs> Karate Kid, all right, Daniel is getting bullied, beat up all the time, so he goes to Mr. Miyagi, and he's like, man, teach me how to fight, and what does Mr. Miyagi do? He assigns them these, just these mundane, menial tasks to do, right? Wax on, wax off. Right? He makes him paint his fence. He makes him sand his floor. He makes him wax his car. And right about the time that Daniel is getting ready to quit, right? He's like cursing at him. He's done. He's like, I'm out of here. That is when Mr. Miyagi reveals to him that everything that he was doing that seemed pointless 
was training him, was actually training him for karate greatness. See, that's what it's like living in your home. God is hiding the holiness that he's developing in you. He's hiding it from you. The kingdom of God is hidden in your home. You know, your engagement and love and service towards your family will determine your ability to win or lose Christ-likeness and beautiful character. Let me try to go around the mountain a different way. So the most important law in all of Scripture, right behind loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, right? is the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Right. Well, consider this. Your spouse and your kids are your first and nearest neighbors. Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and come after me, right? But but where in your life do you have to deny yourself and pick up your cross more than in your home? And at the end of this life, when you and I are looking to inherit the kingdom and we come face to face with Jesus, he's going to ask us a few questions. You know what they are? He's going to say, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, Did you give me a drink? When I was a stranger, did you welcome me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you take care of me? When I was a prisoner, did you come visit me? And you will have the ability to say, yes. I disciplined my heart to do it because I first did it for those in my own home. See, the kingdom of God is hidden It's hidden in your home. It's hidden and it's found in the ministry of your home. So secondly, the second part is the ordinariness and brokenness of God's people. Uh, Jesus comes back to his hometown. He walks into the synagogue. He teaches and and everyone is amazed, right? But then it dawns on them like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait, isn't this the carpenter? It, it, isn't this Mary's son? And they became offended. I mean, the people of Jesus' hometown were offended by the ordinariness of Jesus. I read one commentary that said it this way. They said, the people of Jesus' hometown could not penetrate the veil of ordinariness surrounding him. So Jesus, to them, he was too mundane. He, he, he was too commonplace, right? And this is what they said. They said, Isn't this the carpenter? And so what they were saying there is, hold on. You're not a politician. You're not a religious leader. You're not even from a wealthy family in our community. Bro, you built my kitchen table. (laughs) Like you repaired my fence. What they were saying to him is, hey, you don't come from exceptional socioeconomic timber. You're just an ordinary guy. What's going on here? And then they said, isn't this Mary's son? Now, in this patriarchal society, no one ever called you Mary's son. Okay? You were not called by your mother's name. You are always referred to by your father's name. And so most commentators agree that this remark right here was almost uh, certainly a, resp- uh, a, a reaction to the fact that Jesus was born out of wedlock. And so they said, not only were you not, you know, you don't come from exceptional socioeconomic timber, but bro, you don't even come from exceptional moral timber. But we know your mama. We know the scandal that brought you into this world. Who is this guy? You hear it, huh? I love you. Thank you. Majesty Patterson, everyone. With the colorful jug. I got all girls. Just deal with it. (laughs) 
I put a cover on my phone forever ago just to troll my wife because she bought one that didn't fit hers. And it's been there for like eight months. Longer than that. Wow. <laughs> counting? You're counting. That's what friends are for. Cool. But I, I find myself explaining my, and I'm just done. I'm, I'm, literally, whew, I'm literally done explaining that I just live with girls all around me. It's just, I just accepted it. I have the longest hair anyway. <laughs> and so they were saying, man, you don't come from exceptional uh, socioeconomic timber. You don't come from exceptional moral timber. Man, you're just this regular guy. Now, uh, it's true that familiarity breeds contempt. That's, that's a fact, right? That, uh, that the people who are nearest to you uh, tend to be the people that you take most for granted. That is very true. But I would also submit to you that familiarity also breeds intimacy. It breeds intimacy. See, family life is this pendulum swing of amazement and rage. It's, it's this, this back and forth between astonishment and offense, isn't it? And, and uh, although the ordinariness of your life offends and irritates the people in your home, uh, I, would, I would tell you that it's also the basis of a lot of calm and healing, right? For instance, your spouse has the ultimate authority in your life. They have the ultimate authority in your life. Think about this. Your whole life, there have been verdicts that have been passed down on you, that people have said things about you, and some things have been nice and good, but a lot of things have not been. And it seems as though the, the bad things are the ones that penetrate and stick, right? And so your whole life, people have made verdicts about you. Your parents, your siblings, your teachers, your coaches, your friends, right? Your coworkers, your boss. People have made these declarations about you. But then someone comes into your life who has the ability, because of the nature of your relationship, they hold your heart in their hand. That person comes into your life, and they're actually able to overturn all verdicts, literally redeeming the past. This happens. Um, so I've been preaching for almost 20 years. And um, all throughout my preaching journey, people have come up to me after I preach, and, and this is helpful. I'm not saying it's not, but people will come up to me and they say, man, Sean, you are anointed. And I would just say, hey, thank you. I appreciate it. That's good. Thanks. Right? But if I'm honest, it's, it's always been hard for me to believe. Until one day, Amy and I are at our home, and we have a couple that has come over that we are counseling. Um, and so we're just kind of talking, you know, just talking them through what's going on, you know, with everything. And they are on, on the brink of breakup. It is not going well at all. But by the end of our conversation, this couple is able to reconcile. And as they get up and walk out of our house... Amy looks at me and she says, man, you are anointed. And for the first time, I said, huh, I think I am. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because if anyone knows that I'm not anointed, it's Amy. <laughs> right? That's how this works. There is a power that we have. Listen to me very carefully. This is real. If your spouse says you're beautiful, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. Your friends can call you ugly. Your coworkers can call you ugly. Your Facebook friends can call you ugly. You will walk about feeling like you hotter than a mug. <laughs> Why? Because your spouse has ultimate authority. Now, this is great power, and the reason why is because it can work in reverse, too. That if your spouse calls you ugly, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. Your friends can call you beautiful. Your neighbors can call you beautiful. Coworkers can call you beautiful. Facebook friends can call you beautiful. You will walk around feeling ugly because of the ultimate authority uh, of, of your spouse. The other thing is uh, even these dynamics are real in your home. Um, I was one... One night I was walking around in the house late at night, turning off all the lights because the girls never turn the lights off. 
turning all the lights off, and I'm walking past my girl's room, and I hear what sounds like the laptop. And I go into instant dad mode, because no, right? And so I run in there, and you know, I storm in. I'm like ready to just you know, get on. I, I run in there, and they're asleep. And so I get to the laptop, and I grab the laptop, and on the laptop is a video of me on stage preaching. Me. The one who irritates <laughs> and bothers them all the time is the one whose voice they want to hear as they go to sleep at night. Guys, I'm, I'm just a carpenter. Like, I, I'm Mary's son. This is what's happening in your homes. This is what's happening. The hiddenness of God's kingdom and the ordinariness and brokenness of God's uh, people, familiar people, God is using it to heal and to form us into the image of his son. Lastly, lastly is the, the amplification of God's message. Listen, God has strategically chosen to use marriage to explain his marriage relationship with us, and in his infinite wisdom, he parents us through parenting. And through this short, uh, obscure story about Jesus going home, we get a glimpse of what the whole Bible is about. And what is it? The whole Bible is about this idea that God became flesh. The extraordinary one became ordinary. The unbreakable one became breakable so that he could put us back together again. That's what this is about. Jesus came to this earth and he hid himself in this world by putting on human flesh and through the power of the spirit, he revealed himself by doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. This is what the ministry of the home does for us. It is uh, right now, guys, an opportunity for us to opt in and lean into the major way that Christ-likeness is one in our lives, right? See, some of us are so heavenly-minded that we are no earthly good. Others of us are so earthly-minded that we're no heavenly good. And so we spend so much time trying to make a splash for eternity, and we spend so much time trying to make a splash on this earth. And, we, and in doing so, we tend to take our eye off the ball, and we stop doing the important practical things that move the ball forward in our lives. And if we're not careful, and this is my admonition, this is what I feel like the Spirit of God is saying to me, I'm preaching to myself, and I want to say to you, if we are not careful, you and I will miss the miraculous looking for the spectacular. Did you hear that? If we are not careful, you and I will miss the miraculous by looking for the spectacular. It's the things that are happening literally in your home that are making all the difference. So your participation in God's repair of the world begins at home. Which is to say, and this is the, the great James Dobson, uh, Dr. James Dobson, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the power to do this well comes from what Jesus did for you on the cross. Let's stand together. Um, we're going to pray in a minute, but before we do, um, I think it's important for us to all understand, and Brandon, man, you slayed it in your exhortation. Uh, it's, it's important for us to understand that today is a very important day in the Christian church. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday today. Uh, this is a day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And as he showed up to Jerusalem, to Brandon's point, they laid down palm branches right before his feet. And early Jews would use palm branches to signify the victory of the faithful over the enemies of the soul. That's what they would use it for. And so you and I, 
in our homes are being called into a victorious life. A paradoxical one. Because uh, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he did not count his equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he humbled himself and he gave himself over to be arrested, to be crucified, and eventually killed. He did that for us. The, the extraordinary one became ordinary so that you and I, the ordinary ones, can do something right now extraordinary. See, family life will feel like it's binding you and restricting you. Right? It feels like it's binding you and restricting you. It will feel like death at times. Amy and I have sat down with many couples who are struggling in marriage. And we just looked them in the eye and we said, hey, if God can raise a dead man from the grave, can't he raise up a dead marriage? This is the God we serve. See, because when Jesus died on the cross, he was basically saying this to us. He was saying, forget about me. I love you. F-A-M-I-L-Y. Family. Forget about me. I love you. See, the love and service that you pour out daily in the ordinary wax on. Mundane wax off, ministry and calling of your home to your family, to your spouse, to your children is doing something in you by his spirit that can never be undone. And so if you're here today and you would say, Sean, I need this. I need Jesus. Let me tell you, I, I, I'm here to pray for you and people are here to pray for you. But if you don't have Jesus, the one who can actually give you the power from the inside to do this thing. Brandon said it so beautifully today is that we have an idea of all the people in our lives who need God. But there's an invitation right here for you. And so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Is there anyone here today who would say, Sean? I need Jesus to come into my life. I need him to make me new. Just slip up your hand. We just want to pray for you. Amen. I see you, sister. I see you. Got a few hands up. Anyone else? I see you, sis. Listen, Jesus loves you. Jesus is here for you. Jesus came for you. Jesus died for you. And that's really what would make... Uh, your separation from God, such a tragedy is that the price has already been paid. And the only thing that'll stop you from this today is the pride in your heart that says I can do this on my own. And so this is my last call, we gotta go. Just slip up your hand, we just wanna pray for you. I see you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you. I see you guys in the back. Lord, I thank you for the ones who are bold enough to confess, yes, I need you. Lord, I thank you for this Kairos moment, for this moment for people that will change them for eternity if they are dead serious about it. I thank you, Jesus, that you broke into our lives and showed up powerfully, Lord God, knowing our own brokenness. And that in every area of our lives, Lord God, you are committed to putting us back together. And so for those who raise their hands, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come into their lives and into their hearts. That your spirit would testify to them that they are children of God. And Lord, I pray for the saints in the room, for those of us who understand the gravity of home life and are maybe struggling in that space. If you're here today, you would say, Sean, I'm a believer, but man, I, I need God to show up in my home. 
Just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you as well. Okay, all around the room. All around the room. Lord Jesus, be with your people. God, I thank you that you're a God who knows us in our privacy. Lord, you know us in our deepest moments and darkest moments. Lord God, teach us how to be parents who honor uh, our children and love them well by raising them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Help us to be spouses who honor our spouses well and love them well before you. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Rest on us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.